right, well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this opportunity again to open up the, the Word of God. We ask for understanding, for clarity of mind, and for application that we can take these things that uh, are certainly of great worth in themselves, but also, Lord, that have the possibility to affect people's lives in very tangible ways. Lord, we ask you to use us in all these different ways. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Wow, we got all that technology. That's cool. Well, we've had some very unusual weather here in Oklahoma. But that's normal, right? That's, that's what we expect to be. So that's cool. That's uh, interesting. It's interesting because every, every day... I say to uh, Seppi, okay, now what should I be wearing today? Do I need the coat? No coat. Um, you know, one day we went along uh, to university and people were just stripped down to t-shirts and shorts and jandals. And the next day, whoo, you know, Eskimo City kind of thing, you know. It was something else. Okay, um, so we've been looking at this topic Mid-Acts or Acts 28, and it has again been a tremendous thing to open up because uh, I've learned a lot from this and continuing to learn a lot, which will be of great help and I think assistance. Um, we have been looking at uh, some of these scriptures like this one here, Ephesians 4.12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And I have always taken that to mean... The body of Christ is us. He's referring to us. In other words, this is what I took this to mean. For the work of the ministry, that is, the ministry that we are a part of, for the edifying of us, the body of Christ. That's how I've taken that. I believe it's completely wrong. And uh, if you look down here, uh, I'm comparing it with the body of 1 Corinthians 12, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. And the reason why I showed this is because the context is so clear. It's a complete mapping between Israel's spiritual things and type and the fulfillment right here. You can't help but see it. The, the business of the baptism, the business of the drinking into one spirit, all these things are there. Now, if you look for the expression body of Christ or the body of Christ, if you look for that phrase, you'll see it coming up in different places. Um, for example, Romans 7, 4, Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Yeah, but that's going back to the sacrifice of Christ, his actual body. It's not referring to a group of people known as the body of Christ. It's referring to the work of Christ, his, the sacrifice of himself. Uh, if you look at 1 Corinthians 10, 16, it says here, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood, the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Well, very clear again, this is talking about a, a remembrance of Jesus Christ's sacrificial body, his body. But when you come here, and this is the only other two places where you get the phrase, the body of Christ, now we see a, a distinction. And only two places, right here, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Members in particular. Members by part. We know the context of this thing here. The particular membership is based upon a manifestation of the Spirit of God in terms of gifts. And this body, which is metaphorically given as being a head and all the rest of the body, is all working together because of the manifestation of these gifts. It's put together like that. Now, when we come to Ephesians 4 and verse 12, let's look at that. Let's go there again. I want to point this out and make it clear because there's... There's some things that we didn't go to last time which we need to. And I'm going to go back into the Old Testament scriptures to look at this. So in Ephesians chapter 4, we have the practical section, right? So we, we know this about Ephesians. We have got this clear many times that Ephesians is certainly quite clearly broken up into these two parts where 1 through 3 
gives you the doctrinal um, teaching to do with the, the nation of Israel versus the, um, versus the Gentiles and the formation of this tremendous uh, body together. I'll write it in English. Body together. Okay, you'll find that very strongly doctrinal. And then chapters 4 through 6, this relates to deportment, taking doctrine and putting it into practice. So over here you'd have the practical uh, section where you take things that are very much doctrinal and put them into practice. So it's interesting that the place where we're going to, if, uh, Ephesians 4, is in the practical section, which relates to ministry. What, what are you going to do with this doctrine? How do you put it in place in your life? And so in verse 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Well, these gifts we, we've read about. Uh, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Have you heard of a church called the Apostolic Church? It's interesting to see where various churches come from. One of the big teachings of the Apostolic Church is, comes directly from here. Because it says here, it says, uh, and he gave some apostles. The first in the list is apostles. So, where are they? <laughs> where are they? Well, come across the ap Apostolic Church and we'll tell you. We've got apostles. We've got apostles. You don't have apostles. You got a problem. But we are biblical. We got apostles. Right? So I want to answer this. I think I've, ha I've had an answer to this for some time. And the answer is, well, this is a foundational thing. There, there, there were apostles and they were foundational. And they had a, a function. And, of course, once they died, well, they, they died. And there was no replacements to those. I think I've got a far better answer to this now. Uh, it says this um, in verse uh, 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. All of those there, they were gifts. Those particular individuals were given as gifts. Okay, and it goes on. It says this in verse uh, 12, For, okay, so why did he give these? For a particular reason. This is the reason. For the perfecting, for the perfecting of the saints. Now, the perfecting of the saints. Up here, okay, this catatismon, the perfecting of the saints, ton hagion. So here, this is to do with the mending of the nets. The adjustment, the fixing up. There is therefore... In the context, some problem that needed to be fixed up. All right? And these gifts were given specifically to fix this problem. Right? That's the context. And as we go down here, it says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Well, there's only one body of Christ that we've come across in terms of a phrase where it's made in a way where it's put together with signs and wonders and all sorts of gifts, right? And so here is a ministry which was going on and was given over here. We've got Ephesians here, so I better keep it on this side of the dividing line. So here, Acts 28, all right? So after Acts 28, this revelation is given and these, there are gifts here, these men given to adjust the body of Christ. You mean the body of Christ? Yeah, that's right. I mean, what, do we have evidence, for example, that there were sign gifts still going on after the Acts 28? Yeah, we do. But in a very interesting context, because we get evidence of the fact that there are going out 
uh, we've seen some of these passages, but I want to look at a few more. So what I'm trying to show you is that this happened. Uh, we talked about this before, so I won't go on. But this is the picture that uh, I, I'm trying to establish here as being a biblical idea. That is that the body of Christ, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, and which is instantiated in various localities, it comes together in various localities in Rome, Corinth, etc. You'll see it there, and gifts are manifested. Well, as time goes by, of course, then Acts 28 occurs. And so what happens is the revelation of the mystery is given. Now, when was it given? The mystery, when was it given? Was it given sometime before Acts 28? Now, there's a problem in believing that that is the case. Because then what you've got is you've got Paul gathering the Jews together and, and making an offer to them, which he knows, if he already knew the revelation of the mystery, is not actually legit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense to me that he knew back here the revelation of the mystery. So therefore, at some stage after Acts 28, the revelation of the mysteries given to Paul. Where and when, we don't know. We know that when the book of Ephesians turns up, yes, it's definitely there. So, what we have then is we have the body of Christ here, which to some degree is manifesting, these are believers, right? These are believers in Christ, and they're manifesting various gifts and so on. And these gifts are on the wane. They are going away slightly and slowly. And then finally what happens is that they're gone. And what's left is the church, which is his body. Now, let's have a look at a, a few more passages just to show you this. The first thing I want to show you is in 2 Timothy 4.20. It says, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. That's an interesting passage because it indicates by this stage that Paul did not have the gift of healing. He didn't have it. Otherwise, there's no reason why he would not have used it. He left them um, at, Ma at uh, Miletum sick. And... There's other passages. I want you to look at this passage with me. This, uh, this is in 2 Timothy and chapter 1 and verse 6. And I'm going to put these ideas together and see whether you agree with me. Right? 2 Timothy 1 verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee. Now, if it's just stopped there, I would say there's a, there's a few interpretations you could come up with for that. But you notice what it says, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now that is an impartation of a, a spiritual gift because of the hands, you see. So to me, it's, it's, there is the evidence that gifts at least could be going as long as there was a stirring up. They were not there automatically. Timothy could stir it up. Otherwise, there would be no sense in Paul telling Timothy, stir it up, if he knew there's no way it could be stirred up. Right? It could be stirred up. And he's commanded to stir it up. All right. So therefore, gifts would appear to be a present to some degree after Acts 28. Here's another one I want to show you. Um, this one um, is in 1 Timothy. Um, and five twenty three drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. No longer gifts apparent of healing. Evidence that the gift of healing at least is not available, right? Not available. Coming across here. I want you to look in another passage with me. This is also to Timothy. This is 1 Timothy 4. And this is verse 13. We'll read from verse 13. So 1 Timothy 4 and verse 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Okay, well, who knows, right? 
but it goes on. Which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, the presbyteroi, the eldership, who could impart a spiritual gift. And he's saying here, neglect not that gift. Well, therefore, it would imply to me that it's available to some degree. It was available. And that's after Acts 28, right? Now, you might say, but you're now preaching stuff that's destroying everything that we've been, <laughs> we've been holding to. Well, I'm just trying to be biblical, right? Because I think I've got a, a fairly clear answer to some of these things, which, it, which are completely biblical. Now, we looked at that passage, all right? Neglect. Notice the word, neglect, which implies that it could be neglected. Now, if you look at the promises given to Israel concerning the Spirit, look at this. This is, this is a typical passage. Ezekiel 36, 27. I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. I will cause them to happen. I will put my spirit in you and cause you to do these things. And you can see examples of this at Pentecost where they're completely taken over by the Spirit of God and caused to do things, right? You see this happening. But man, that's very different to this, isn't it? There, where there's the possi possibility of neglecting the, the gift. And then down here, stir up. Stir up the possibility you don't stir it up. And these are specific to Timothy. Okay, so there's an obvious comparison here. Now, coming on further, let's just take this another step further. I want you to look at this passage. This is in the book of Acts, chapter 20. So if you look at Acts, chapter 20, and verse 19. Acts 20, verse 19. Um, it says this, we'll read from verse 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Well, this is interesting because we have been reading from, uh, from Ephesians. Okay, And now this is uh, the church at Ephesus before Acts 28, before this revelation. And it says this, and when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greek, repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and he says this, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not, look at his knowledge, this is his knowledge, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth, in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. This is, I believe, a scriptural statement of Paul's knowledge about the future ministry coming. That is, he only knew that bonds and afflictions would abide him. And with that, certainly there is the prospect of more ministry, but precisely what that would be, it does not appear to show definitely in the book of Acts, anything about this, right? It's not part of his knowledge. That is the revelation of the mystery in the book of Acts. Okay, so what am I saying? What is the, what's the, the basic message of what I'm saying here? Well, what I'm saying is that for some time there were these apostles and there were prophets and there were pastors and teachers who were specifically given as gifts to minister to these people who had been manifesting gifts and things related to Israel, and they were to be adjusted. They were to be adjusted to the revelation of the mystery and to the new hope which was set in store. These gifts were 
on the wane. They're on the decline. We've got evidence of it. Until finally they disappeared. And so would have these gifts. The gifts. When I say the gifts, I'm talking about the men. The people who were given as people who had the function of adjusting these people. Well, some of them would have been adjusted. And some of them would not have, right? Some would say, hey, this, this is too hard for me, man. I, I don't know about this. But they would be given an explanation and they would be preached the unsearchable riches of Christ and some would ag agree to it and some would not. That's their business. The hope is based upon, that is the hope in the heavenly places, is based upon a gospel, the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ. The hope that they entertained before them was the hope of Israel. If they believed that, God would give them that hope. If they accepted the new hope, God would give them the new hope. I see no problem with that. The only thing that perhaps we need an adjustment, talking about this catatismon, if you want to talk about our adjustment, we all have got to adjust ourselves to understanding the scriptures the adjustment that i have accepted now is that there were signs after acts 28 there were things that were going on they were in the decline and god let that happen because he was in the process of ministering to the body of christ you say well what are we what what's our specific name what name is given to us well we are given the name the church which is his body that's us the church which is his body why because christ is the head in that metaphor and that's the metaphor which is ours the other metaphor the body of christ had to do with signs and wonders and so on now if i can get to this have a look at this these passages here this is acts 8 18 when and when simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles hands the holy ghost was given why am i giving you this I want to show you what's associated with the laying on of hands, which is clearly the context that in which Timothy is being asked to stir up this gift, either through the impartation of a gift through the presbyteroi, the, pres the presbytery, or through Paul himself. Stir it up. Remember. Okay. And then over here, 1 Timothy 4.14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee. And we've read that. And then Hebrews 6.2, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the these are the ABCs. These are the foundational ABCs of that economy. And God is going to use these things at the beginning of this age to try and reach out to this um, body of Christ. Um, okay, now I want you to come with me now to the book of Numbers. We need to go to the book of Numbers. And this is Numbers chapter number 11. And I want you to see things to do with the gifts um, and see how much they are associated with Israel. Numbers 11 and verse number 24. And Moses uh, went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered, gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and sent, set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him. Now let's get this again. Let's make sure we are, we are reading this right. It says in verse 25, And the Lord came down in a cloud. Now the Lord, notice it's in capitals. This is Jehovah. This is Yahweh, the one, the one who is the covenant God with Israel. Came down in a cloud and spake unto him, and took of the spirit that was upon him, that's Moses, and gave it unto the 70 elders. Wow, this is wild stuff here, isn't it? He took of the spirit that was on Moses and then gave it to the 70. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, look what happened. They prophesied and did not cease. Isn't it interesting? Cease. Remember that word comes up in the context in 1 Corinthians. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad, and the Spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, 
but went not out into the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. So what was supposed to happen is they were supposed to come out of the camp and go to the tabernacle, and there they would get this spiritual manifestation. But these two gentlemen, they didn't do that. But they were of the group that were named that should have. But what happened was the Spirit rested on them. And it says, and they prophesied in the camp within the, the major body of the Israelites. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, El dead and Mel and me dead do prophesy in the camp. What's going on? My wife always laughs at me because when I talk about other people, I put some sort of voice on. <laughs> and Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of the, the, his young men, answered and said, My Lord, Moses, forbid them. Forbid them from doing this. Now, what Moses says next is very instructive. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses got him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. It's a very interesting response. It's not, in other words, it's indicating that what, what's wanted and would be desirable is that the whole camp would manifest this, right? Manifest this thing, which is the work of the Spirit of God. Now look at another thing here. Um, so much in here. I want you to look at Exodus uh, chapter 28. These gifts, right? These gifts have a context. Though the people, the members of the body of Christ, which you remember is not us, the body of Christ manifested these gifts in the same context as the hope of Israel. Now look at this. Exodus 28 and verse, uh, verse 2. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. Two things. Glory and beauty. Not just beautiful things, but also glory. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Gifts of the spirit are there, right from the very beginning with Israel. And the picture of the baptism into the body of Christ talks about this manifestation of the Spirit, which was clearly Israel. So in other words, when people start the church of which we are a part in the, the book of Acts, then what they're doing is they're taking Israel's spiritual things to themselves, right? That's what they're doing. And furthermore, they're showing evidence that they need some ministry. They need to be adjusted, right? They need to be adjusted. Well, guess what? While I am not literally a part of the group that are the gifts who were there for this reason, nonetheless, we are still a part of some kind of adjustment. We have got a ministry of a kind of adjustment where we're trying to show people the truth and the revelation of the mystery and try and get them out of this kind of confusion. I think really the the message about the body of Christ is another one of those big moves. It is for me. It's, it's clarified a lot of things. Very, very clear. And I would like to bring this up in, uh, in, in even more clarity as we look at further passages in the Old Testament, especially in Numbers, where it shows you that if you take Israel's spiritual things, then you've got to accept the hope of Israel. And that hope is definitely not the same hope that's offered in the prison epistles, which relates to the heavenly places. Well, let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee this morning for the revelation of the mystery given to Paul the prisoner. We pray that we'd be ever ready to expose and show the truth, clarify things, and adjust as we are given this clarity. We pray for this fellowship, the ministry online, Lord, that people from around the world will come to the revelation of the mystery and run on to perfection. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.